What is the craziest thing you've experienced or seen during a flight? So we're flying from SF to Cincinnati. In the middle of the flight, the pilot announces to fasten seatbelts because they're expecting a bumpy ride. Apparently, there is a very tall weather disturbance that had been reported. Just prior, he casually announced that we were at 40,000 feet, expected time, etc. I believe 40,000 was the number, but it may have been a bit less. After the announcement, we hear pop, 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 tons of them, and we're all like, what the? Really bumpy. And it turns out it was giant hail hitting the plane. Really bumpy. Pilot again announces more sternly for all crew to take seats and no one gets up. Really, really, really bumpy. Then wham, we're freaking falling out of the sky and there is no other way to describe it really. I guess it was like you were just sitting in a chair suspended from a rope at the top of a cherry picker and then someone just cuts the rope. And then we begin to drop, 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 drop some more, then wham. Like the plane landed in an enormous vat of cream filling. Sorry, that's just what it was like. Kind of soft, but still a big jolt. But more on one wing than the other, so the plane landed askance and all sorts of crap went flying out of the right bins to the left, nailing people in the heads. Some people, not completely or at all buckled, stupid idiots, flew up and hit the ceiling, then back into their seats, screaming everywhere, absolute chaos. Then, FML, the pilot screams over the intercom, Denver, we're in serious trouble up here, I need, and a few other words we could not understand. It freaked everyone out. He forgot to turn off the cabin speakers from the earlier announcement. Rough, then drop all over again. The same thing, but a much harder feeling landing. I mean, we dropped for what it seemed like minutes, but it was probably 10, 15 seconds. Wham, a much harder landing. Crap flying everywhere, people crying, praying and screaming. It was nuts. We cruised through that and it became smooth again. Pilot later announced that he was sorry about the mistaken overheard announcement, etc., he also said that the current altitude was something like 18,000 feet. Whatever the exact numbers were, we had friggin' dropped about 10,000 feet, two miles. It was the worst of my 500,000 plus air miles, and you never heard so many people clapping upon landing. I personally believe clapping should be standard practice after a safe landing on every flight. I mean, think about it. Two guys just landing a giant flying machine made of metal pretty safely. Now that is always a job well done. Story 2. I was asleep on a flight and the attendant was walking by and accidentally spilled some hot chocolate on my arm. It briefly startled me awake, but I was so tired I just went back to sleep. I was woken up a short time later by an attendant apologizing and offering me a free shower radio. So there I am, half awake, with a soggy chocolate stain on my arm and a shower radio in my hands. Also, I saw someone fart themselves awake, then just go back to sleep. The shower radio was the crappiest trinket ever, too. Didn't actually stick to the wall, could barely be heard above the sound of running water. It was a net loss to accept that shower radio. Story 3 so a guy passed away next to me once. On a flight from Maui to Dallas, I was half asleep in the second to last row of the plane. While I was listening to music and dozing off, I suddenly heard a really loud, hard thud next to me. I look over and there's a man lying on the ground completely still. I thought maybe he tripped, but then the flight attendant came running and he was unresponsive. She frantically ran up and down the aisles asking for doctors. Luckily for him, the flight was full of vacationing doctors and nurses all of them in ridiculous clothes. Two of the doctors who came back were in Hawaiian t-shirts and golf attire, and the female nurse who came back was wearing a very strappy, revealing blue Hawaiian print dress. The doctors tried to wake the man up, but he was gone. I was surprised, actually, to find out just how much medical equipment they have on commercial flights. The docs whipped out a portable defibrillator and shocked the guy, then set up an IV drip for him. I never heard a word out of him or saw him move, not sure if he actually woke up or not. Our flight was diverted to LA, and when we landed, half a dozen EMT personnel ran on the plane to pull the guy out on a gurney. Unfortunately for me, this whole scenario set off a panic attack, and I had to go find a nice spot in the aisle to lay down so that I didn't pass out and cause more problems for the crew and doctors. It was embarrassing. That is like the worst situation I could ever imagine. Story 4. Not really during a flight, but close. And whilst I was a former aircraft cleaner, we cleaned when the passengers got off the flight and had to finish before the next round of passengers got on. Usually a turnaround time of 5 to 8 minutes to clean a 717 or 737. Anywho, as you can imagine, I've only not seen nightmares. I was the guy who had to confront them. 
And yes, I remember it well. A flight had just landed, and I waited in the jet bridge for the passengers to exit the plane. As soon as the last passenger got off, I went on to do my thing. Suddenly, a flight attendant comes running down the aisle, screaming at me that someone obliterated one of the back bathrooms. At first, I was a bit cautious. After all, the flight attendant's definition of a mess varies greatly with what us cleaners would consider a mess. So I go into the bathroom, and my god, someone took a liquidy mashed potatoes and gravy without the mashed potatoes dump in the trash can. Now, I'm not sure if you know the size of a trash can opening on a 717, but it's barely enough to fit your hand in it. It also has a push open door, so yeah. Checking my watch, I only had six minutes to clean the bathroom and the entire cabin, equipped with two bags, two pairs of disposable gloves, and a small bottle of air freshener. Game time. I told the civilians to stand back. The entire crew stared at me, including the front deck and gate agents. I slapped my gloves on, flared my bag out, and gave them the look. Then I stepped inside the small bathroom and shut the door behind me. And I wish I could tell you that I fought the good fight and the bathroom let me be. I wish I could tell you that, but aircraft cleaning is no fairy tale world. Needless to say, the task had been completed within half a minute or so to spare with the passengers getting ready to board. There were no thank yous. I expect none at all. It is my job after all. And none of the passengers suspected a thing. I got off the flight just as they were coming down the jet bridge, saving them the hassle of a ground delay which could have caused a domino effect. Indeed, these are the things that we do so that others may fly. Story 5. I was flying from Calgary to Houston, which is normally about a four-hour direct flight. We were just about two hours into the flight, or coincidentally just about to Denver, when the pilot announced we would have to turn all the way back around to Calgary. So around we went and landed in about an hour 15, and he really cranked on it. We touched down and taxi over to the mechanics. They opened the cargo door and shut it again, and in 15 more minutes, we were fueled up and in the air and off to Houston. This time, it was about a three-hour flight, full thrust the whole way. Luckily, there was an industry guy behind me, and I overheard him speculating the reason. His idea was that since the airline had paid mechanics in Calgary and probably not in Denver, it would be cheaper for them to turn around all the way to Calgary than pay all the costs associated with landing in Denver. Luckily, it was just a little glitch and not a true problem, but it was anyone's guess, the true issue. I have a friend that is very familiar with the inner workings of the plane, and he said that any time they open the cargo door and unplug a certain cable during maintenance, some switch has to be flipped to reset that alarm system for that door. He said it's an extremely common mistake for that switch not getting flipped after work has been done and it results in false alarms. All that cost, likely in the tens of thousands, because one guy forgot to flip a switch. Story 6. I used to travel internationally a lot when I was younger and working for a telecom company designing new infrastructure. On one of the trips, as we were heading to China, I looked out the window. We were above Alaska and the Bering Strait somewhere, and the horizon had a huge slice of black, like some weird wedge-shaped cloud that encompassed half the horizon. It was a bright day on the ground or sea below us. The ice was very bright and white, but there was this giant dark wedge encompassing and seeming to take over the earth as you looked out to the horizon. I had the guys next to me look out and take a look too, and they were confused at first. I was really confused for a few minutes myself, then I finally realized what I was looking at and what that engulfing black wedge really was. It was just night. We were flying in such a manner that we were surfing the edge of daytime and nighttime at 35,000 plus feet, and at that moment, if you looked out over the horizon, you saw daytime fading into night. I only ever saw that once. It was being in the right place at the right time. I have a picture somewhere I may be able to dig up, but aside from bad in-flight movies, that would be my craziest experience so far. Story 7. I wasn't there for it, but this happened to my cousin. He was flying in South America, and about halfway through the flight, he realizes he really needs to take a whiz. The plane he's in is a tiny prop plane made for tiny people, and he's about 6 foot 5. So he awkwardly climbs over his aisle mates and stumbles and shuffles to the back of the plane. As he's closing the door, the captain comes on the loudspeaker and warns of upcoming turbulence. He thinks, screw it, I really need to take a leak. And he crams himself into this tiny bathroom, and right as he starts, they hit a huge bit of turbulence that knocks him off his feet, backwards, through the bathroom door and flat on his back in the aisle, still whizzing straight up in the air. He was completely mortified and managed to get back up, pick up the door, and work himself back into the bathroom. 
and then he waited for like 20 minutes, hoping no one would have seen it or at least forgotten about it by then. But when he went back out to take his seat, he got a standing ovation from every single person on the plane. Ouch. A standing ovation and there was turbulence? I guess they were willing to risk it, but don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. No risks involved. Story 8. I was on a flight home from South Africa after a family vacation. My dad is a diabetic, but he usually keeps his blood sugar levels pretty regulated, so I never worried before. Mid-flight, I wake up from a nap and see him slumped over the side of his seat. He was taken to the back of the plane where three doctors were examining him. They said his heartbeat went up to 220 or something, which I think means he was an inch from death. All I remember is seeing my mom and brother break down. I began having flashes of life without my father and it completely overwhelmed me. I felt sick to my stomach imagining what life would be like when all of a sudden his heart rate stabilized. The doctors on board said it was a miracle and I felt so much relief. The plane had to stop in Senegal where my dad was transferred to a hospital. He wanted me to keep going since the semester was starting soon. That flight home alone was terrible. I felt the other passengers watching me the entire time. He's all right now, but every time I get on a plane, I always remember that feeling of leaving the whole world behind. Story 9 Not on a plane, but in the security line. About two years ago, while about 10 people in front of my family were in the line, a guy ran past the metal detector. It goes off, he doesn't stop, and I couldn't tell what one of the security men yelled, but he yelled it three times. Instead of stopping the guy, all the guards and people behind the desks run into two rooms and close the doors, leaving all of us passengers standing there freaking the heck out. A minute or two pass, a ding goes over the PA system, everyone comes out of the rooms. The PA system says, thanks for being cooperative during our drill and have a nice day. I was on a small turboprop and saw sparks shoot out of the engine, terrified but quickly forgot about it when they handed out some pretzels. Not related. I was on a flight from London to NYC in first class. There was nothing like it. We got a salad before the main course, and as I started munching on it, I noticed my lettuce was starting to move. I used my fork to inspect the situation, and it turns out there was a spider in my salad. I didn't want to cause a panic, so I quietly alerted the stewardess, and she nearly shrieked. She apologized and offered me a bottle of wine. I declined because I don't drink, but it was quite nice. Story 10. I went to Vegas with my wife. First, let me say it was an early flight, so we get there extra early for check-in, put our bags to the side so as not to get in anyone's way. But this 300-plus pound grease ball wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts comes waddling in with one carry-on bag. Remember this part, it's important, and knocks over my neatly stacked out-of-the-way baggage. It's also 15 degrees outside, pretty freezing, and 5.14 early in the morning, and I'm like, whatever, no big deal. And then later we get on the plane. My wife has the window, I'm in the middle, and here comes too fat for the seat Hawaiian guy with his little bag to sit on the end next to me. Ugh. Now let me tell you something, this guy, he smelled so bad. I literally dry heaved when he sat down next to me. The guy had a carry-on bag that he was clutching like it contained something of utmost importance, obviously not deodorant, and he was sweating through his thin red flowered shirt while everyone else was bundled in heavy winter jackets. We hadn't even taken off yet and I was becoming violently ill-smelling this guy. I had to stuff my face in my sweater and throw my head in my wife's lap to try and escape the smell. After an hour, the guy becomes increasingly fidgety and paranoid, and this made him sweat even more. I can't figure out how a guy who sweated this much was so fat, he was like a walking sauna of used banana hammocks. Finally, the guy gets up to use the bathroom, and as soon as he closes the bathroom door, people began ripping cologne and perfume ads out of magazines and rubbing them on his sweat-soaked chair. I kid you not. And then people were offering their apologies to me for having to sit next to him. Then the stewardess comes over and says, I'm sorry, the flight is booked. There's nowhere else to put him. And I'm staring at her like, what are you talking about? I never said anything to anyone about it. And that's when I realized this guy was such a freaking disgusting mess, people were actually rallying around me to try and help me. It was the weirdest moment of my life. For the next five hours, he made about 20 more trips to the bathroom, and each time, different rows would come over to rub his seat down with cologne. Oh, and you know what was in the bag? Adult magazines. He took a new magazine to the bathroom with him each time. I have not been on a plane since. Story 11. This was 11 years ago, so I don't really remember where I was traveling to, but it was in the United States. I was sitting at the gate waiting to get on a flight and saw this couple walk up to the gate agent. 
old guy, bald, maybe late 50s, and a woman in her late 20s, at best, who looked like she was maybe Peruvian. They were holding on to each other the whole time, so I assume they were an item. Didn't think anything of it other than that she was too young for him. So I find my seat on the plane and notice both of them are in the seats in front of me. Flight takes off without a hitch, but about 45 minutes into the flight, we hit some turbulence. Then we hit some more. Then the captain gets on the overhead and tells everyone to sit down and buckle up because they apparently asked the tower to move out their flight course but were denied. The turbulence gets increasingly rough. I had to hold on to the armrest a couple of times. The plane dropped several times intermittently and it felt like we were on a frickin' roller coaster. I was getting the same sensation in my stomach anyway. So there I am in the aisle seat about halfway back in the cabin. The guy in the window seat in my row looks at me and says, Look at the wing! I look out his window and the wing looks like it is waving at us and that is how much the plane was dropping in the turbulence. Now my father was an instructor pilot in the Air Force when I was a kid and he has been a commercial airline pilot for the past 22 years. So as a child, I remember seeing a wing do the same thing on a flight he and I were on. He noticed that I was a little unnerved by the situation so he leaned over and explained that if the wing didn't move up and down like that with some room to give, that it would snap right off. So that calmed me down and the rest of the flight was uneventful. So I look at the guy in the window seat next to me and tell him the same thing. Then boom, we hit a huge pocket of turbulence and half the cabin screams. And we land at the bottom of the pocket really hard, the hardest of the flight. And two of the overhead compartments come flying open. Coats falling out, people yelling. And one of the compartments is in the row behind me on the opposite side. So at my like 8 o'clock. And all I could envision at that point was luggage flying everywhere and hitting people. Right as I start to unbuckle my belt to close it, the guy sitting under it gets up and closes it. I was just hoping that we didn't hit any turbulence while he was up or he would have gone flying into the ceiling. And then I turn my head back to the front of the plane and focus in the foreground and see that the older gentleman in front of me, well, his head is drenched in sweat, beads just rolling down his face. His quote-unquote wife, or whoever she was, starts freaking out. She didn't even know a lick of English, and it didn't sound like Spanish, so she wasn't Peruvian. Well, in any event, she knows enough to hit the flight attendant signal, which was hilarious because, again, I have the aisle seat so I can see everything, and the flight attendant just peeks her head out into the aisle from her seat against the cockpit like, are you freaking serious? What, you want a bag of nuts right now? Priceless look on her face, by the way. And I will never forget it. She ducks her head back in and gets on the overhead and reminds everyone that the seatbelt sign is on and that everyone needs to stay seated. I look back at the woman in front of me and she's terrified looking at her husband. Then I see his head just roll to the side. I immediately hit my call button and about three other passengers hit theirs as well. The flight attendant makes her way up the aisle. I felt bad that she had to get up during the turbulence, but this guy was obviously in trouble. She comes up to the woman and asks what's wrong, but she can't break through the language barrier to tell the flight attendant what is wrong. She just starts crying and bawling. So the guy is out cold at this point, and the turbulence must have given him a heart attack or a stroke, I don't know, but he just passed out, and all of this is happening right in front of me. Now, flight attendants are trained in CPR and some minor first aid, but this looked really serious. The flight attendant, let's call her Sally, gets on the overhead and asks if there are any doctors or nurses on the plane, and within about a 10-seat radius, five people raise their hands. I was shocked that many people with medical training were on a flight. It was a lifesaver, though. A female nurse comes over and starts taking his pulse and undoing his shirt to give him some air. She's doing all of this while we're hitting turbulence, mind you, so another flight attendant comes over and kind of grounds her by holding onto her hips while the nurse attends to the man. Pretty cool idea, actually. Then, a third flight attendant comes over with a crash cart and first aid kit, and then they sit the defibrillator on my lap. Sally and the nurse concluded that he wasn't breathing, so they shot him up with something. I don't know what it was. But that nurse, she freaking stuck him with a needle, like a boss, on a flight with the worst turbulence I've ever experienced. It was pretty impressive. Then they pull out the defibrillator and rub the paddles together and say, clear, amazing. These flight attendants and nurse were awesome. So they stabilize the guy and he moans a little bit and that was a great sign. Everyone in the surrounding area starts clapping and everyone goes back to their seats, but Sally stays with him the whole flight back. We were already too close to our destination to make an emergency landing somewhere else, so the captain said we were just going to land as normally scheduled. We land and we get the VIP treatment. I have never taxied so fast in my life. I don't even think the pilot ever throttled down for the landing, just right up to the gate. 
probably took 30 seconds from touchdown. An ambulance was waiting too. The plane stops and some peckerwood stands up in first class to get his bags to get off the plane. Then Sally was like, sir, sit down. That was it. Pretty crazy. I shook both the pilots' hands and thanked Sally on my way out. I think it was a Delta or Northwest flight. Pretty impressive all the way around. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed the story so far in this video. And if you made it this far, a big thank you to you. And I'm sure also you're going to enjoy what's the scariest thing that happened to you. Story three will keep you up at night. I promise you. I'll see you in that video. And also, thank you for watching this one.